So, you know, my, my view is, my, pers my personal view, there, I, I, can't, I can't claim this is a fact. I can only claim that, that I, have a, I have arrived at some personal opinions about these mysteries through my research and through my, my own exploration. If I were to put money on this issue as a kind of bet, uh, I, would, I would say that, that what happens to us in altered states of consciousness, certainly what happens to me and, and uh, others who I know, uh, in an altered state of consciousness induced, for example, by ayahuasca uh, or by pure, pure DMT, uh, is that we are gaining insight and, uh, and a direct connection to another level of reality, which indeed interpenetrates and surrounds our own, but is normally not accessible to us. We are, um, it's understandable that we need to focus on the physical world that surrounds us. If we don't, if we, if we aren't adjusted to the physical world that surrounds us, we will not survive physically. And, and this, this need to survive in, a, in an often hostile and difficult physical realm has led human beings to focus a great deal of their energies on the physical world. But what the plants, what the altered states of consciousness seem to allow us to realize is that there may be other realms beyond that, perhaps non-physical realms, in which we may have experiences and encounters that can be shared by others. Uh, who can also enter those same realms in, in altered states of consciousness. So to me, the idea of a freestanding parallel world uh, that, we may, that we may access, at least with our consciousness, perhaps we cannot put ourselves physically there, but we can, as, as I said earlier, it's as though there's a, a secret doorway inside our minds that through which we may project our consciousness into another realm and encounter that realm and experience it directly. To me, that's a very attractive idea and it, and it fits very, very closely with my own experiences. But I, I have to say that there is, a, there is an alternative possibility. And this possibility was first brought, certainly brought to my attention by Jeremy Narby's work um, on, on DNA uh, and, and, and the notion that there may be information uh, encoded in our DNA. See, the basic problem we have to solve is why is it that people all around the world, when they enter altered states of consciousness, have remarkably similar experiences of realms that, according to orthodox science, are supposed to be non-real? Um, the, the conventional theory of, of, of hallucinations, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, in a state of disturbed brain chemistry, the individual sort of randomly stitches together various wild uh, thoughts and experiences, but puts, puts, it, puts it all together into a kind of mishmash. If that were absolutely true, then you would expect everybody to have very different experiences in altered states of consciousness. And the extraordinary thing is that everybody has very similar experiences in altered states of consciousness. Now, why should we all have very similar experiences of non-real things? For me, the best experience, the best explanation is that actually they aren't non-real. Those, those encounters, those realms, those beings are real in a sense that we don't fully understand in the, in the physical world. But another possibility uh, is that we are accessing, again, to use the analogy, not so much a hidden doorway inside our own minds through which we project our consciousness into another realm, but a hidden archive inside every one of us uh, containing a body of, of, of information which we may again only access in an altered state of consciousness. And if there were such a hidden archive, then the only place that it could be stored would be on DNA, which is the, the mechanism of inheritance and is passed down from generation to generation. That would explain why people 35,000 years ago and people today uh, see the same things in altered states of consciousness because they share their DNA and the information is written on DNA in, in some way. Um, so I had to do some, I had to do some research into, in, into the mysteries of, of DNA and to try to understand what DNA is and, and, and what, it, what it might be. And the first thing that came as a surprise to me was to learn that, you know, I thought that, that modern science had really got DNA taped and that we understood it completely. And the Human Genome Project seems incredibly impressive. Um, hundreds of worthy individuals all around the world combining their efforts to kind of unlock the secret of the human being. And then I discovered that actually this only relates to about 3% of, of our DNA. And that's the 3% of our DNA that is gathered together in our genes. And all the rest of the DNA is referred to as junk DNA, uh, as though it has really no function. It's just there sort of accidentally. Now, there's some intriguing differences between junk DNA 
and uh, the DNA uh, in genes. And, and one of those intriguing differences is that there seems to be a linguistic structure to junk DNA. There was a linguist back in the 30s, his name was Zipf, and he is, um, he's responsible for Zipf's law, which has detected in all human languages uh, a hidden deep structure uh, that if you, if you take a large text or a large speech in any, in any language and count up the number of words in it, you'll find that some words occur more frequently than others. And there is a, I won't go into the mathematical details here, it's better, it's better done in an illustrated format really, but, but there is a, it, it results in a straight line on a graph that you have um, a, a very specific mathematical relationship between the rank of a word and its, uh, and its frequency. Um, and and uh, this occurs in every human language, and it's identical in every human language. Doesn't matter if it's Mandarin, doesn't matter if it's Inuit, uh, you know, it can be English. It, it, whatever the language is, that hidden mathematical structure is always there. And the very weird and strange thing is that the identical hidden mathematical structure is found in junk DNA. It is not found in the DNA in our genes. It's found only in junk DNA. Um, and, and when I talked to Eugene Stanley at, at Boston University, who, who first exposed this peculiarity and asked him what he thought it meant, he, he, he said, I think there's some kind of message in, in our DNA. Um, now, I'm not sure how far he takes that, and you would need to, to talk to him about it, but the notion of a message being, being written in our DNA, an archive, if you like, and that that archive is what all of us are accessing in altered states of consciousness would also explain uh, these extraordinary similarities uh, in, in altered states. I then, I then began to look a, a little further at the, at, at the whole issue. If an archive of information has been recorded on our DNA that we may only access in altered states of consciousness, how, how did it get there? What, 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 what led to that? How do, we explain, how do we explain in evolutionary terms the preservation of supposedly random, non-real, and useless information? How, how, does, how, does, um, how, how does evolution select for that? It, 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 just doesn't make, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And, and so I began to look at the, at the deeper mysteries of, of DNA, and I went into the work of Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winner. Now, Francis Crick was certainly not a spiritual man. He, um, he didn't believe that there was any, th any such thing as the, as the spirit world. Um, he was a frank uh, atheist. Uh, but there's some curiosities about Francis Crick. It came out after his death that his discovery of the double helix structure of, of DNA uh, was the result of a sudden insight under the influence of LSD. Uh, and he regularly used LSD in the 1950s and felt that it enhanced his uh, creativity. Of course, it was legal in those days and, and uh, isn't now. Secondly, uh, Crick was a, was a man who, although he would be held up as a, a paragon of mainstream science um, and uh, would be, he's not alive now to, to, to comment on this, but would be, would be strongly opposed to the notion of intelligent design, Nevertheless, Crick could not accept that the DNA molecule had evolved on this planet. Uh, he felt that there just wasn't time. Uh, it, it, it was just, you know, there's this notion of a primeval soup which lay upon the early Earth, and that somehow molecules just bumping into each other by accident uh, created DNA. It just happened totally by chance. And that is, that is the mainstream view of, of science today, that it was just a chance reaction. From Crick's point of view, the Earth solidifies as a planet four and a half billion years ago. It's cool enough to support life by 3.9 billion years ago. And by 3.8 billion years ago, there is bacterial life all over the planet. Um, bacterial life based on, based on DNA. Uh, Crick felt for this, just statistically, for this to have happened by accident in such a short period, it was completely and utterly impossible. And he and, and uh, the astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle um, you know, put forward the analogy that you would be more likely uh, to assemble a fully functioning jet airplane by passing a hurricane through a junkyard 
than you would be to assemble DNA by accident in any kind of, of primeval soup. Uh, so to cut a long story short, Crick suggested that the DNA molecule got here from somewhere else. He said there's been 13 billion years since the Big Bang. Uh, plenty of time for a life to have evolved twice. I don't believe it happened here on Earth, but maybe the circumstances were just right, just perfect, in some other part of the distant universe. And uh, the DNA did evolve by accident there. He wouldn't contemplate the notion of any kind of spiritual intervention. It had to happen accidentally somewhere and uh, started off with bacteria, and then they gradually evolved into intelligent beings. And, and remember, this is the Nobel Prize winner, Francis Crick, uh, who is saying this, not me, uh, that, that uh, a process of evolution take, took place on this hypothetical distant planet, and uh, finally an intelligent creature appeared, more intelligent than us, perhaps, created an advanced civilization, and then, in Crick's hypothesis, they discovered that they faced certain doom that there was going to be perhaps a supernova explosion in their vicinity. They couldn't get their bodies off the planet. Uh, they might have looked at that possibility, just as we would if we were faced by a similar disaster. Uh, but the distances in interstellar space are too great uh, to transport fully formed bodies or, or, or all of that way for millions of years to, to land on some planet eventually where life might be sustained. So what he suggested they would have done is they would have tried to preserve the essence of life. And he suggested that they would have got hold of bacteria, packed them into cryogenic uh, chambers in spaceships, fired them off into the universe in all directions. And one of those spaceships hit the early Earth 3.9 billion years ago, spilled out its contents of bacteria. They immediately began reproducing. And here we are, the end result of, of that process. To that basic hypothesis, and we, because it comes from a mind of the caliber of Crick's, and because he did win the Nobel Prize for his work on the structure of DNA, we can't just dismiss it automatically. To that, that let's say that hypothesis is true. If there were such a, a distant civilization in another part of the galaxy that sought to preserve the essence of life, wouldn't they have gone a little further? Wouldn't they have, um, wouldn't they have sought to insert information into the DNA that they were sending out? so that eventually, on some other planet where that DNA took form, uh, that eventually, when an intelligent being had evolved again, that intelligent being might be able to access that information. Um, and and uh, this is the other suggestion, that that is, that that is why there is, there is information written on DNA. Um, it, it's technically possible uh, to record information on DNA. Patents are being taken out by our scientists now in order to do that. It seems that the recording potential of DNA is limitless. It would be possible to record the entire knowledge of a civilization on DNA. Maybe that's what happened. Uh, maybe that's, that's what's on our DNA, on the junk DNA, uh, and, and can only be accessed in altered states of consciousness. And lo and behold, the first time our ancestors accessed that information, that was the moment when we became human all, all around the world and, and uh, became the beings that we are now.